Jesus has led me all the way. Amen. Praise God for our shepherd, our shepherd king. Well, if you take your Bibles, please turn with me to the book of Philippians, chapter 1. We saw this morning from the end of chapter 1, verse 18. Well, first of all, we understand that the Apostle Paul had passed remembrances of the Philippians, and they were all joy. All joy. He looked back on all the ministry of those 10 years with the Philippians, and all he could say is, I re- all, in all of my remembrances, I make a request of you with thanksgiving with all joy. So there's nothing in the past that would steal his joy. Even his present circumstances, that he's imprisoned in Rome, chained to guards, he says, that will not rob me from my present joy, nor the problem people, those preachers that were preaching out of envy and selfish ambition, adding affliction to the chains of Paul. Even that would not rob uh, the Apostle Paul of his joy. And then at the end of verse 18, he says, yes, and I will rejoice. Looking into the future, whatever circumstances I may run into, whatever comes upon me, I will rejoice. So joy is a choice. It's an act of the will. It is a fruit of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. We saw that Paul chose joy. He also chose confidence. He said, for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance. Verse 19. He had confidence in the Lord that he would be delivered. Either he would be set free and delivered from prison that way, or his head will come off and he'll go to be with Jesus and he's still delivered from prison. The deliverance is still there. So he's got certainty and confidence in the future. So we want to have joy in our future, confidence in our future. Thirdly, hope. The Apostle Paul's hope was that in nothing he would be ashamed, but with all boldness, with freedom of speech, Christ would be magnified in his body, and that was his hope. Not that he he would have ease of suffering, not that he would get out of prison and maybe spend the retirement years with his feet up on 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 relaxation mode, but his hope was that he would be a faithful witness for Christ. And then finally, he had life. He knew that for him to live is Christ and to die is gain, and we covered all of that this morning. Now tonight we continue on in verse 22. Let me read the text. And then I'll pray. Verse 22 of Philippians 1. The word of God says, But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. For I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. Let's pray. Father, we bow before you and our hearts are are full. They've been saturated with truth from godly hymns, from prayers and praises cast before you. And we know, Father, that you are good in all that you do. We can be joyful in your character and in your promises. We can be confident in your plan for our lives that ultimately those who trust in Jesus have everlasting life. And we will be with you face to face. Thank you, Father, for the hope that is before us, this earnest expectation that with all boldness, we will be faithful in our witness to Christ. And then, Father... For us, living is all about Christ. He is the preeminent one. He is the one that we worship and serve. Everything else is lost, but to live is Christ. And then to die and to leave this earthly path is gain. And so thank you, Father, for these words of truth recorded by the Holy Spirit for us today. May you have your way working through our hearts and our minds to bring about even more devotion and loyalty and love for Christ that would bring about good works that Christ may be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Not everyone can say that. Um, I I know uh, years ago, I don't know if you ever heard of the Weta Brothers Band, but... (laughs) 
There was the Weta Brothers Band. It was an accordion and a piano and a guitar and drums. And, and we began booking out every Friday and Saturday night. My mom knows most of our um, practicing was in our basement in the house. Loud music, clashing cymbals and drums and accordion of all things. And they put up with it. But we would go out every Friday and Saturday night. But after I got saved, oh, I'd, I wanted nothing more to do with that. And I remember this one scene right before I finally ended it all. And um, with, with the band. And it was down at the VFW Post 137 in West End. And it was one of those 9 p.m. to 1 a.m. things. And back in those days, you could smoke inside the building. And it, there was a heavy haze of smoke. I was a new believer, a heavy haze of smoke. And there was um, dancing and a lot of drinking into drunken stupors and gambling with pull tabs and all of this kind of stuff. And I just remember that uh, we finished uh, our, our final, our set around midnight or whatever, and a man who was completely drunk had probably spent his last dollars with pull tabs getting nothing in return, and he goes, there ain't nothing better than this. He said that. He's like, it doesn't get any better than this. And I thought, really? A darkened bar with smoky haze, spending all of your earnings on foolish pull tabs, and there's nothing better than that? Is there nothing greater in life than that? And the Bible has the answer. There is. There is another world. There is a place where believers will go where we will see Jesus face to face. And for Paul, he described it as gain. Heaven is gain. It's, it's great gain. It is far better. I went through and I, I looked up these famous last words of people. And you'll be familiar with some of these individuals. But I want you to know people's words on their deathbed show you what they think or what they know of the world to come. Here it is, Francois Rabelais, a French philosopher, he said these final words, bring down the curtain, the farce is over. He died in 1553. Voltaire, we know Voltaire hated God's word and hated God, he said this on his deathbed, I am abandoned by God and man, I shall go to hell. O oh Christ, O oh Jesus Christ, were his final words. Thomas Paine, one of, our history, one of our country's great writers, in his final words, he said, I would give worlds, if I had them, if the age of reason had never been published. O oh Lord, help me. I am alone to be in hell. Winston Churchill, this great man of, Brit of Great Britain, a man whose vision and battle cry was to never give up, on his deathbed, he said, I am convinced that there is no hope. That's what he said. Before dying of a heart attack, a Jewish novelist, Atalo Sevo, told a nurse who was trying to administer the last rites, when you haven't prayed all of your life, it's no use at this last moment. Cesar Borgia, he said, when I lived, I provided for everything but death. Oh, I provided for everything but death. Now I must die, but I am wholly unprepared to die. Ed, Edgar Allan Poe, the famous poet, of course, uh, and writer, he said with his life of lies and drunkenness, he was 40 years old when he died, and he, they found him on a street near death, and he cried out and he said, Lord, help my poor soul. Isn't that tragic? these individuals without Christ, without hope in this world. Now listen to this. Martin Luther said on his deathbed, our God is the God from whom cometh salvation. God is the Lord by whom we escape death. Praise God for that. Augustus Toplady, who wrote Rock of Ages, at age 38, as he died, he said this, I enjoy heaven already in my soul. My prayers are all converted into praises. Richard Baxter, the 17th century Puritan, he said, I have pain, but I have peace. I have great peace. John Knox, he uttered these piercing words, live in Christ, die in Christ, and the flesh need not fear death. And then uh, uh, August Strindberg, who was a Swedish dramatist, he died in 1912. As he lay dying, he grasped a Bible tightly to his chest, and he said, it is all atoned for. He's safe. Isn't that amazing? What a difference. Listen, everybody. You know, Erwin Lutzer years ago wrote a book, Five Minutes After You Die. It's a great book. I'm going to tell you five seconds after you die. Real quick. If you're an unbeliever without Christ, your faith is in your works, your religion, your rituals, 
something, your heritage, whatever it might be, if you are without Christ, without faith in Christ, the Bible says five seconds after you die, Luke chapter 16, beginning in verse 19, you are in a place of torments, plural, in a place called Hades. You are, you are in torments. The Bible says you will be agonizing, desperately wanting one drop of water for your tongue. You will never be satisfied. You'll have no hope. You'll have no peace. You'll have no contentment. You'll have no rest. You'll, no have, you'll have no blessedness. You'll be self-centered, self-focused, and you will be absolutely beginning from that point on for all eternity in agony. That is, that is what happens immediately upon the death of an unbeliever. That place, Hades, will someday then be cast into the lake of fire, Revelation chapter 20. But can you imagine for an unbeliever, a second after they die, five seconds after they die, that is what they experience. For a believer, a second after we, the moment that we die, we instantly see Jesus face to face. We look into his eyes. We, we see the pierced uh, hands and feet. We hear his voice as the sound of many rushing waters. And, and we understand that we are accepted in the beloved. There will be every day without sin, no sin in us, no sin around us. There'll be complete joy and peace and blessing and satisfaction day after day after day. There'll be an increase in knowledge of spiritual things and of the word of God, Jesus being our teacher. Can you imagine what heaven is like? No wonder why Paul said, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Well, here, to continue on from this morning, Paul is wrestling be between these two options, living on earth or dying to be with Jesus. Here's how he says it in verse 23. I'm sorry, verse 22. But if I live on in the flesh, that's option A. So my first point is wrestling. Paul is wrestling between two things, between living and between dying. Verse 22. But if I live on in the flesh, if that's the option that God selects for him, and Nero, during the court hearing, Nero sets him free and he gets to go out and live more on this earth. Here's what he says. If I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet, what I shall choose, I cannot tell. Paul's like, I'm wrestling between two things. Dying to be with the Lord, which would be an easy way to have perfect peace, or living on earth. And if I do end up living on earth, here's the guarantee. It will mean fruit from my labor. He is going to be serving and laboring for the Lord his whole life. And if he gets a few more months or a few more years, they will be devoted to service to Christ. Wouldn't that be the attitude? None of us have yet died. We're still here physically in our bodies. We should have the same attitude. Whatever time God gives me, a year, two years, 10 years, 20 years, some of you younger people, 40 years until the rapture, until the day the Lord returns for the church, you, you, make it, you, you make it your desire and your goal to be fruitful in your labor for Christ. Well, what's fruit? Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 verse 13 says this, Now I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I had planned to come to you, but I was hindered. Then he says this, That I might have some fruit among you, as also I do with the Gentiles. Paul says, one aspect of fruit from my labor is winning people to Christ. Sharing the gospel, part of the fruit is sharing the gospel so others come to Christ. Paul says, if I, if, if I live on in the flesh, it's going to be, mean fruit from my labor. And one aspect of the fruit is I'm going to share Christ with people so they also can trust him. Isn't that great? In Romans chapter 6, holy living, which is the fruit of the Spirit, is, is called fruit to live holy for Christ. Romans 6, 22, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have fruit to holiness and in the end, everlasting life. Paul says one aspect of my fruit is winning people to Christ. Another aspect is I'm going to live holy for Christ. H-O-L-Y. I will live a blameless life for my Savior. That's his goal. He says, if God lets me live, there's, it's going to count for something. My life will count. In Romans chapter 15, verse 28, Paul says he's talking about the famine that comes upon Jerusalem and how he's collecting money, financial resources for the Jerusalem believers in, in, uh, that are dying of a famine. Paul says, I am gathering these financial 
um, offerings as fruit to be given to those Jewish believers. So Paul says, part of my fruit is going to involve giving of my resources for the ministry. I'm going to give my resources so the church can be built and for, uh, and for others to be saved. Finally, in Colossians 1.10, Paul says, I pray that you may walk worthy, fully pleasing him. And then he says, being fruitful in every good work. Part of bearing fruit is, as labor is good works, doing good to others. Serving, using your gifts of speaking and serving in the church, building up this body. All of this is fruit from his labor. And of course, you've heard me say this one just recently in the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, verse 15. One of the sacrifices that we offer to God as, as a spiritual priesthood is praise from our lips, which Hebrews 13, 15 says is fruit. The fruit, which is the praise from my lips. Paul says, if God lets me live, it's going to mean I labor. Labor is hard work. And out of that, I'm, I want to bear fruit. Winning souls, good works, a holy life, giving financially, and then praising God with my lips. This is what my life is going to look like. And then I think, what does my life look like? Is that, is that kind of fruit just growing and radiating in my life from a result of laboring because for me to live is Christ? I hope so, and I want to make it my aim and my goal. So Paul says, if I live on in the flesh, it's going to mean fruit for my labor, but I don't know what God's going to choose for me. So he says in verse uh, 23, for I am hard-pressed between the two. Do you see the wrestling? He's hard-pressed. I don't know if you've been to the country of Jordan and you've gone into Petra, but I've been there. And uh, when you go into Jordan, when you go into the city of Petra, you go to the, you're going to the ancient city, there's this wide open walkway, a large walkway, and many people can walk side by side. But as you're walking to the ancient city, you know what happens with the two canyon walls? The two canyon walls become, begin to go like this until you finally get to the ancient city of Petra and you are literally, you can't ride a camel or anything, you literally are, are single file going with one wall here and one wall here to get into the ancient city. It's like you're hard pressed between two. I, I, I want to go and be with heaven or with Jesus in heaven. I want to, that's, that's what I want. And yet I also want to stay on earth and have fruit for my labor. But I don't know which is gonna be, I don't know what the case is going to be, but that's what I'm wrestling with. Now look at my second point. The second point is, here's what Paul wants. Verse 23. I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire. See the word desire? Having a, a passion, a lust. He wants one of the two more than the other. You know what he wants. He wants to depart and be with Christ. Paul says, I'll tell you honestly, church, he's telling the Philippians, I'm in, I'm in a wrestling match between staying here with fruit from my labor we're going to be with Jesus face to face. I'll be honest, I want to go be with Jesus. I want to see him. He says, I have a desire to depart. So for death, for Paul and every believer, it's a departure. That word depart is analuo, or analio in the Greek, analio, and it means to loose, to loosen or to uh, untie. It was used by three groups of people. Sailors used this word depart. They would be like this. Our ship is anchored in the port. It is time for us to go to another shore. Lift the anchor. But instead of saying lift the anchor, they'd say analio. It would be lift up the anchor. We're going to another shore. Sounds a lot like heaven, doesn't it? Paul says, I want to lift my anchor and I want to head to another shore. I want to, I want to head to the shores of heaven. I want to depart. That's my desire. It was secondly used by soldiers. You know, soldiers would have a bivouac uh, in a large camping area and they would sleep in a tent at night. And after they'd been there and the commander says, it is time to move on, he would say, Analio, Analio the tents. It would mean to loosen the tent stakes and then have your tent come down upon you. I, I did a little bit of camping when I lived in Israel. I was single at the time and we went out to the Negev desert and they gave, I received, because I had no tent of my own, I received a pup tent. 
Do you know why they call it a pup tent? Because that's about all you can fit in it, a little pup. And it, and it was so small, and it had two stakes, one on each end. And at night, I would put it in the desert sand, and um, having sat around the campfire thinking, this is cool, I'm, a, I, I'm, I'm a, like a Bedouin in the deserts. Um, then I would crawl in, and then the tent stakes would fall, and it would, it would literally analayo, it would lo loosen up and it would collapse on me. And by morning, my face is with wet nylon as the dew of the morning desert. Uh, it, it, like every day. And finally, I was like, I am done with tents. I, it, and isn't that the way Paul felt? He was done with this body that had been beaten with rods, l many stripes laid on it. He was stoned and left for dead in Lys Lystra. He had been shipwrecked out in the deep for a day and a half. On and on, imprisonments, um, sleeplessness, fastings, nakedness, he says. He's like, I am ready to pack up this tent and go be with the Lord, where I get my permanent house, a glorified body. Thirdly, this word depart was used by farmers. At the end of a day, they would have their oxen, and they would bring their oxen into, back into the barnyard area. And all day, the oxen had a yoke on them. And the farmer would say, Analayo, I'm going to loosen the yoke. And he would loosen the yoke and take the yoke off the oxen. And they would be like, about time. Now I can have rest and peace. And so, and so Paul says, I have a desire. I'll tell you what I really want God's will to be. I want God's will to be that I lift up my anchor. I collapse my earthly tent. I get the yoke of, of labor off of me. And I go to be with Jesus. So that's the departure. I have a desire to depart. But listen to this. You know what he doesn't say? He doesn't say, I have a desire to depart and go to the streets of gold. And I want to sit back and I want to eat a big meal and not have any calories. I don't ever want to get tired. I don't want to have a disease. I don't ever want to have to die. I don't want any tears. He doesn't say that's what heaven is. What does he say? I have a desire to depart and be with Christ. Do you see what makes heaven heaven is Christ. If Jesus Christ is not in heaven, I don't care how perfect it is, I don't want to go there. I want to go where he is. Do you remember John 14? He tells his disciples on the night in which he was betrayed, he says, do not be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God? You believe in God in the Old Testament? Believe in me, Jesus says. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may be also. Jesus describes heaven as the place where he is. Not like the streets of gold and I get to have as much fun and never sin and I don't have to work and it won't be like work and every day is fun. Heaven is not about the stuff. It's about an encounter with our Savior face to face. Do you agree? So Paul's desire is to depart and to be with Christ face to face. And then he describes it this way, which is far better. In the Greek, far better is three Greek words. It's polis, like poly. Poly is many. A, a polymer is many uh, 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 things. Poly means many, so polis. And then melon. Melon is the second Greek word. And melon means uh, much more, many more. So it's, uh, it's many, and then much, much more many. And then the, the final word, crescent. So it's polis, melon, crescent. That's what he says heaven is. It's more many, many, more, more. And then crescent is like the very most excellent. It's used of two Greek words, kratos for strength, like crater. Kratos is strength. And agaths is good. Paul is saying heaven is far better. It is, in, in the, if you, a literal translation, it would be like heaven is many, even more than many, it's an awesome excellence is what heaven is like. So whatever heaven is like, we can't even understand its absolute beauty and delight because Christ is there, our Savior. It's amazing. 
So, so that's what he wants. He's, he's wrestling. He's like, I don't know what's going to happen. Am I going to live or am I going to die? I'll tell you what I want to happen in my own life. I want, I want to go to be with the Lord. That's what I want. But then, for my third and last point, look at what he's willing to do. Verse 24. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh, which means living on earth, is more needful for you. He's willing. So he's wrestling between two things, life and death, staying on earth, getting out of prison, or going to be with Jesus. He really wants to go to, G to be with Jesus, but he's willing to, to say, Lord, if your will is that I stay on earth, here's what it's going to mean. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you, Philippians, and being confident of this, he really thinks he's going to get out of prison. He does. He thinks he's going to get out from this first case against with Nero. Being confident of this, verse 25, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all. Why? Why does Paul, why is Paul willing to stay back and not go to heaven right away? Why is he saying, I really want to go to heaven, but I want to go to heaven, but I'm willing to stay back? There's two reasons. Number one, I want to be with you all for your progress and joy of faith. Paul says, I want you to grow in your spiritual life. I want to stay back on earth so that you all will grow spiritually. Now, I'm really selfish. If I died right now, I would be the happiest person in the room. Well, maybe not. I don't know what you think of me. But, but if I were to die, I, I would be like, Lord, that is what I want. I don't want another moment on earth. I don't. I don't want another year on earth. I don't want 10 years on earth. I want now to go to be with Jesus. I want to see him. I want to touch him. I want to thank him face to face. I want to sing with the saints of heaven. I want to worship around the throne. I want, I want to bow before him, and I want to put my feet uh, on my face on his feet, and I, and I want to weep and say, thank you, thank you for saving my soul. That's what I want. But nevertheless, if it's more needful then staying on earth, I want you to progress in your faith. I want you to progress in your faith. I want you to grow spiritually minded, strong and mighty in the word of God, bold in your witness to the community. That's, what, that's why I'm staying. Well, the Lord gets to pick that day. But as long as I stay, my heart is, I want Faith Baptist to grow, to grow spiritually to mature in their faith. And then secondly, he wants to add to their joy. He wants to add to their joy and delight of Christian living. So I, I don't want to like be a, a bummer in your life and a downer where you're like, oh no, Brian's coming around. Oh my, you know, I want to bring joy to your life. I want to see you progress in the faith and then have absolute joy in the Lord. And Paul says, I'm confident that this is the case. I believe God is going to get me out from under Nero. I will be set free, and then I'm going to be, I'm going to do everything to, to, how did Paul progress the faith of the Philippians? Who, who got this letter first? The Philippians. Do you think they read this and took it to heart and grew spiritually? You bet they did. And do you think they read this and they were bursting with joy? I think they were. And that's what I want you to do. I want you to progress in your faith and burst with joy. And then he goes on, verse 26, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. Then Paul says, when I actually physically, physically can be with you and we can go through the word of God and go through the Old Testament verse after verse to see the glory of Christ in everything. Paul says, you're going to have such great rejoicing when we all unite again. So this is Paul's heart. So I would say this, as long as you're alive, can you do two things? Number one, can you build up the church? Seriously, Paul says, as long as I'm alive, I want the progress of your faith. I want to build up the church. This is what Paul cared about. You know, that is what I care about. I care about strong and healthy churches. I want every church, not just ours, but every church to be a gospel-preaching, Bible-centered, growing church. Now, many don't have 
the gospel or true doctrine, I pray those would close. I'm serious. I pray those would close. But for gospel preaching, Bible-centered churches, I pray they would grow and mature in the faith so that the Lord would have a whole network of his children proclaiming the gospel until he comes for the church. So build up the church. Bring others joy. This church has a lot of joy. I, lo I love how before church, there's lots of chatter and encouragement and joy. And then after church, it just continues on as well. It is so, it is so refreshing and so encouraging to me to see the joy of the saints here. But if God lets me live any longer in 2024, uh, he might. He might let me live another year. I don't know. But if he does, my heart is for your progress and for your joy. I'll do anything I can. I will give of myself to that, to that end. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for these very personal words of the Apostle Paul. He is suffering in a Roman prison, having been incarcerated for two years in Caesarea. He's now on three to four years of imprisonment, and he hasn't lost his joy. He has no idea when he stands before Nero if Nero will let him free or if Nero will condemn him to death. But for Paul, he really wants to be with you. He agonizes, he, he desires to depart and to be with Christ, which is far, far better. And yet he really is confident that he's going to live longer. And as a result, the Philippian church can be strengthened they can show progress in their, in their faith, and they can have great, great abounding joy. And that's my heart, Father. As a, a shepherd, you have allowed to, to serve your sheep here. I have just been entrusted to each of these lives. They mean so much to me. I will give my life and, uh, and all that I have for their progress in the faith and, and for their joy. And so, Father, help me to to be uh, a sensitive and a caring and a kind shepherd. And I just pray that we as a whole, as a whole assembly of believers, would, would have great, great joy in your character and in your promises. So thank you, Father. Thank you for giving us more time on earth to labor and give, and give fruit, show fruit for the labor. For the name and for the glory of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, there you go, everyone.